This is Dr. Mailer, and welcome to our overview of Chapter 2 of The Scientists by John Gribben. Uh, John Gribben calls this chapter The Last Mystics, and you will meet and hear and read about a wonderful, unusual, interesting story of two of the most famous scientists who have ever lived, Tycho Brahe and Johann Kepler. A very, very unusual pair. But before we get to the, the how unusual they were and the incredible work that they did, first we'd like to talk a little bit about the nighttime sky and uh, a few characteristics about that. Let's take a look at this first diagram. Here's the planet Earth, and there is a yellow line coming out the South Pole and the North Pole. Let, pretend that imaginary line, that's called the axis, and what we discovered years ago is that the imaginary line, the North Pole, is pointing almost, almost directly at the North Star, or Polaris. So this makes for a very uh, unusual thing uh, that happens when you observe the night sky. And we can show you that in the next picture. What happens is, this is a wonderful photograph of the camera being aimed at its center is aimed directly at the North Star and its shutter is open and they take this picture probably for an hour or two and what each one of those little trails that you see is a star and that's how the stars move in the night sky and the reason they appear to move they don't really move compared to Earth is because we're spinning underneath those stars and uh, there are lots of photographs like this, and they're very, very beautiful. And the people who studied the sky hundreds of years ago understood this pattern. But there was something strange about the night sky. All of these stars moved in this predictable pattern every night, and they could see it, except there were other bodies out there of, uh, that were not stars that moved through the sky in a very unusual pattern. And let me give you an example of that. In the next picture, uh, we have the stars, but those red dots represent the planet Mars. And if you take a look at Mars on May 1st, that's 5-1, so to your right, watch what happens. Ten days later, it moves a little bit to the left, a little bit more to the left, but they certainly don't move in predictable patterns. And then, for a while, it moves left or right to left, and then it goes back to left to right and returns. So Mars, as well as the other planets, move in a very unusual way in the night sky. As a matter of fact, the word planets means wanderer. So the planets and their movement was very different than the movement of the stars. And that was a huge puzzle to people that lived hundreds of years ago. And these two gentlemen are going to figure that out. Now keep in mind while you're reading this chapter that relatively speaking, the planets are much closer to the Earth than all the stars, except the Sun. All the stars are trillions, quadrillions. They're of miles away. They're light years away. Our Sun is 93 million miles uh, away, and that's the closest star. But all the other stars are very, very far away. On the other hand, the planets are relatively close. So that's something to keep in mind while you read this chapter. The first character that we're going to meet, the first scientist that we're going to meet, is Tycho Brahe. Tycho was always rich throughout most of his life. He was successful, he was eccentric, and he was obsessed with the sky. He wanted to know everything about the sky, and he had uh, an, an wonderfully creative, inventive mind, and he invented all sorts of instruments to do observing of the night sky. So here's Tycho's sextant, which was one of the things, and this, this thing was huge. He built huge, huge instruments. Here's his quadrant, and all of these were used by Tycho to take really good observations. You can see that's Tycho there pointing to the night sky, and one of his assistants is writing down his observations. And these observations were all in the form of data. As a matter of fact, he had so much money and so much backing that uh, he even built an observatory on an island. And I'll let you read where that is and, and how that came to be th through his sponsorship. Uh, here's a closer shot of the main building at his observatory, which is called Uraniburg. You'll read about that too. Now Tycho what, had a huge ego. I'll let you read about why he lost his nose and why for most of his life he wore a piece of gold over his nose. But he was also very, very jealous of the data that he had. 
he had a he had wonderful tools to collect the data, but he didn't have the mathematical mind in order to build a model from that data to make an explanation. So he had the data, but he couldn't kind of figure out what it meant. Well, that leads us to Johann Kepler. Kepler was a brilliant mathematician, but he had an incredibly very, very difficult life in every sense of the word. His marriage, his position in life, his um, uh, dis he was diseased, he had a lot of diseases through his life. He just had a very, very difficult life. And it wasn't until later in Tycho's life that he comes in contact with Kepler. And he recognizes that Kepler can really help and build a model, but he's jealous. He doesn't, he doesn't want to let Kepler have the data. And I won't spoil the story too much. I'd like you to read about that, but how these two men get together, it's really, really fascinating. But once Kepler gets hold of the data, once he starts working with Tycho's data, he comes up with three of the most important laws uh, in planetary movement. Well, they are the uh, three laws of planetary movement. The first one says that planets circle around the sun in an ellipse, not a perfect circle. Up until Kepler's time and with um, Tycho's data, he proved that planets don't go around the sun in a perfect circle. They go around in an ellipse, and the sun is at one of the focal points, and it's just empty space at the other. So that's a planet going around the sun. Kepler also discovered his second law. And this one's fascinating, although the diagram isn't great, because I'll explain that in a second. And what that says, that in an equal period of time, let's go from April to May in the bottom right there, an equal area is swept out by a planet for each equal amount of time. Now what that means is that as the planet it gets closer to the sun, a little bit closer, it moves a little bit faster. And when it's further away from the sun, it moves slower. But this diagram is really exaggerated for you to understand that. So know that it is not anywhere near as much as an ellipse in this, but the diagram itself is exaggerated. Kepler's third law said that the square of the orbital period, now the word period here means the time that it takes, uh, of a planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. Don't worry too much about understanding this completely, but know that this was Kepler's mathematical abilities coming through. This, the, uh, the first and second law uh, were done with Tycho's data. The third law was Kepler uh, really doing a lot of the, the thinking and modeling on his own. Uh, it was after, I'm pretty sure it was after Tycho dies that uh, Kepler publishes his most famous book. They're called the Rodolphine Tables. And what they are is they're tables of star and planet movement. And it's using Tycho's data, but it's Kepler's model that explains what's going on. This was really the acceptance of the, uh, the, the, uh, a lot of the evidence for the Copernican model. Um, that came from the work of these two scientists. So for this chapter, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to focus on reading all about these two men, their circumstances and their discoveries. Um, again, I will only ask very general questions about these two um, scientists, but it's a fascinating story and I hope you enjoy it.